Hello, welcome to the September 17th Nutritionist Webinar. I am Marianne Fezenden from AMTS and your English language host. This monthly webinar series provides technical talks from internationally recognized educators for listeners around the world. Paula Torillo from Cordoba, Argentina translates and hosts a Spanish language webinar. Marcos Neves Pierre from Lavras University in Mina Geres will join from Brazil. There will be a question and answer period immediately following the presentation. Listeners can submit questions through me, Marcos, or Paula. A complete recording of archived webinars as well as a question and answer session for each will be available on the AMTS website. This month, we are pleased to host Dr. Lance Baumgard, a professor from Iowa State University. The Norman L. Jacobson Endowed Professor of Nutritional Physiology, Lance received his bachelor's and master's at the University of Minnesota with Dr. Brian Crooker, and his PhD from Cornell University with our July speaker, Dr. Dale Ballman. With a 70% research and a 25% teaching appointment, and yes, I know that does not add up to 100, Lance has numerous papers, abstracts, symposia presentations, and trade articles to his credit. He receives consistent high reviews from his students for his lectures, with quotes like, hilarious, awesome, amazing lectures, balanced by tough grader, and my personal favorite, skip class, you won't pass. Baumgart's primary research emphasis has been on the metabolic and endocrine consequences of heat stress in growing and lactating animals. His talk will be Leaky Gut's Contribution to Heat Stress and Ketosis. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Baumgart. We look forward to an educational and exciting talk. I'm going to turn the presentation over to you. Well, thanks for the opportunity. I, I always enjoy presenting some of our data. Today's talk is going to be on Nikki Gut's contribution to heat stress and ketosis. Uh, the, my co-authors that need um, acknowledgement are Sarah Stokes, Aaron Horse, Mackenzie Dixon, and Mohammed al -Khazi. They're graduate students in my program and they've uh, been very productive. And two longtime collaborators, Pat Gordon here at Iowa State and Rob Rhodes at Virginia Tech University. So the origin of our hypothesis is essentially that um, poor productivity that occurs in all farm animals during the summertime is, is leaky gut. The origin is leaky gut. And we also believe that leaky gut is uh, contributing to some of the problems we see in transitioning dairy cows. So just a quick reminder before we get too far into it about how important glucose is, right? Feed is fermented in the lumen. There's three volatile fatty acids uh, produced, primary. The propionate is the is the main gluconeogenic precursor that occurs in the liver. And glucose is the precursor to lactose synthesis in the mammary gland. And just a quick reminder, um, lactose synthesis is the primary, not the only, but the primary osmotic regulator of overall milk yield. So if anything disrupts this pathway by which propionate is converted in the liver to glucose and glucose is taken up and used for the synthesis of lactose, it has a large opportunity to um, reduce milk yield and overall farm profitability. <clears throat> so I, I don't want to get too much into heat stress because I have a lot of slides and, and I think a lot of people have kind of seen this data before, but one of the questions we had have, have had for a long time is essentially that when farm animals become heat stressed, there is a decrease in, in appetite. And does the decrease in appetite on our feed intake explain the decrease in productivity? So we wanted to look at that further. So we always use this pair feeding model. And essentially what we have is a group of heat stressed cows. Um, we allow them to eat ad libitum, but of course there's a decrease, uh, there's, a, there's a willing decrease in feed intake, a voluntary decrease in feed intake. We measure that decrease and we implement the same uh, magnitude and pattern of, of, of reduced feed intake in a group of thermal neutral cows. And the thermal neutral cows then are we call pair fed because they're 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 pair fed to the thermal to the heat stress cows. So in this particular um, uh, figure, we're looking at feed intake in heat stress cows, and there's about a 35% reduction in, in in feed intake. And then by design, the reduction and pattern of reduction in the thermal neutral cows or the pair fed cows is the same. So the next 
um, figures looking at milk yield. And of course, the pear-fed cows have a reduction in milk yield of about five kilos um, because they're consuming 30% less feed. But then she adjusts her metabolism to make milk, right? The heat-stressed cows have a continuous and progressive decrease in milk yield for about six to seven days, and then there's a plateau. So what we know now then is that all this area between the two lines has nothing to do with reduced feed intake, but in fact everything to do with reduced feed, with, um, with just simply being hot. And Rob and I have essentially spent the last 15 years chasing down what, what could explain this, this differences in, in milk yield. So <clears throat> just by doing some simple math, we know that the reduction in milk yield, about 50% of it is due to reduced feed intake and 50% is due to something else. In the next uh, 45 minutes or so, we'll talk about what that something else is. So interestingly, when an animal um, goes off feed intake and goes in this negative energy balance, they would normally mobilize adipose tissue to support the synthesis of milk. And that's exactly what the parafed cows do. There's a, there's a gradual increase in, in plasma non-acerified fatty acids, or a proxy of adipose tissue mobilization. The heat stress cows do not mobilize adipose tissue, and it turns out this is a highly conserved response amongst heat stressed animals, pigs, beef, dairy, rodents, et cetera. And just simply, despite the fact that they're in negative energy balance, do not mobilize adipose tissue, probably because of this hyperinsulinemia. This um, hyperinsulinemia occurs, again, not only in heat stress cows, but also in heat stress beef and in pigs and in rodents. Actually, it also occurs in snakes. So it's a highly conserved response, and this hyperinsulinemia is preventing adipose tissue from being broken down during heat stress. So uh, the nice thing about lactation, of course, is that we can do an accounting of, of carbon at each milking. And we know that the pear-fed cows are secreting about 400 grams more glucose in the form of lactose per day than the heat stress cows are, are, are secreting, despite the fact that they're consuming the same amount of feed. So almost all of the circulating glucose in a ruminant comes from gluconeogenesis. So the question then is, are heat stress cows simply, is the liver from heat stress cows simply secreting less glucose per day? Or maybe the liver is working fine and that some other tissue is utilizing almost a pound more glucose per day. So to get at that, we measure rates of whole body glucose production. And what we have here is parafed in the yellow and heat stress in the red. And during period one, there's no treatment being implemented. These are just cows that are destined to become parafed or cows that are just destined to become heat stress during period two. And, and what this is demonstrating is there is a decrease in hepatic rates of gluconeogenesis, but the decrease is the same between the parafed and the heat stress cows. So what does that mean? It means that the decrease in glucose output in the form of lactose is not the liver's fault. The liver's making the glucose. It's just not being utilized for the synthesis of milk. And for about 10 years or so, we chase muscle because muscle is the largest tissue in the body. It's insulin sensitive. And it just makes sense that the muscle is utilizing extra, extra glucose. I'm going to try to convince you by the end of the talk that it's probably not the muscle. Most of it's probably the immune system. So let's just do a very quick review of the GI tract. Um, reminder, the GI tract is a tube. Envision it as a tube running from the animal's mouth to its anus. And everything inside that tube technically remains outside of the animal's body. And it's hard for students oftentimes to wrap their head around that. But, you know, everything inside the lumen of the GI tract is technically outside the body. And we oftentimes think of the GI tract's primary job is to digest and absorb nutrients. And clearly that's important. But if you're an immunologist, you might think of the primary job of the GI tract is to prevent unwanted molecules like parasites, pathogens, acids, enzym, enzymes, toxins, et cetera, from infiltrating into the body. So there's a huge barrier. So just to give you an idea of how big the GI tract is, um, we're all familiar with our skin, right? The, the, the barrier function of our skin, and we the skin's about two meters squared in size in a human. The next barrier, epithelial barrier, is the lungs. It's about 50 times bigger, that, bigger than that of our skin. 
the GI tract is, is incredibly large. The, the surface area of the GI tract in a human is at least 150 times that of the, of the skin. And of course, in a ruminant animal with the pregastric fermentation compartments, this could probably be up to 500 to 1,000 times bigger than the skin surface. So it's huge. We take a human's GI tract and lay it down flat on, on the ground. It's the size of a double tennis court. Now, I'm, I'm emphasizing how big it is um, for, for a couple reasons. One is that the GI tract is constantly exposed to potential pathogens and antigens, right? It, um, it doesn't get the opportunity to, to clean itself, to wash itself. It's, it's constantly exposed, and the area that's exposed is an enormous, enormous area. So then if you understood how big the GI tract is and how it's continuously exposed to potential pathogens, you'd understand then why not only did the immune system evolve out of the GI tract, but still today, about 75% of the immune system resides in, or in, in an animal's GI tract. So the reason why it's important to understand the GI tract is because the heat stress uh, markedly alters um, the GI tract, primarily because when an animal starts to accumulate heat, there's a vasodilation at the skin. The vasodilates at the skin because it's trying to maximize radiant heat dissipation. And of course, if you, if you do not, if you're going to vasodilate the largest tissue of the body, the skin, you have to vasoconstrict somewhere else. Otherwise, you're just not going to get enough heart back blood to the, to the heart, and the animal dies from a heart attack. And the area of the body that vasoconstricts is the GI tract. And blood flow to the GI tract will be decreased by up to 50%. And the, unfortunately, the intracytes that line this, this, that create this barrier in the GI tract are very sensitive to hypoxia. There's also multiple reasons for osmotic stress. Essentially, digestion continues inside the lumen of the GI tract, but because of the reduced blood flow, the, the removal of, the, of those digested end products and the absorption decreases. The pictures with a thousand words um, on the left is villi from the ileum of a healthy ad libitum fed animal. The villi are long and they're slender, hallmarks of a healthy GI tract. It's difficult to even identify the villi structures and the heat stress. And importantly, especially with regards to the last third of, the, of today's talk, the villi of the pear fed thermal neutral animals is also shortened and blunted, the characteristics of, a, of an animal that has a damaged barrier function of its intestine. So there's hundreds, if not thousands, of things inside the GI tract that you don't want infiltrating an animal's body. And one of them is called lipopolysaccharide. It's a, a outer component of, um, of gram-negative bacteria. It's everywhere. It's on your fingers. It's on your pen. It's on your paper. It's 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 obviously all chalked through an animal's GI tract. It's fine if the barrier function of GI tract is intact. It ends up in your toilet or the animal's manure. No big deal. But if the barrier function of the GI tract becomes compromised, now this LPS has an opportunity to infiltrate into the body. And when it does, it stimulates the immune system, it creates a catabolic condition. This is a little cartoon that some of my students put together, a lot of biochemistry that's not important. What is important, though, is that these enterocytes synthesize these tight junction proteins. There's at least 50 different types, probably more. And these tight junction proteins then are embedded on the lateral side of, of the enterocyte, and they reach out and physically uh, make a uh, connection between the tight junction proteins of its neighbor's cell, neighboring cell. And what this, do this does then is essentially creates a physical barrier that prevents infiltration of unwanted molecules from getting from the outside world to the inside world. Now, when, the, when these cells become stressed, for whatever reason, could be heat, could be osmotic stress, could be hypoxia, whatever, these tight junction proteins are pulled back into the cells that made them, and essentially this allows them for a highway where these pathogens, antigens, LPS, et cetera, can, can get in. And of course, here's the local immune response. If the local immune response is overwhelmed, they travel via the port of blood to the liver. Now the liver, it can be thought of as an immune organ, um, there's Cooper cells, macrophages, resident macrophages that will detoxify LPS and other antigens. But if the liver's ability to, to detoxify gut-derived antigens has been overwhelmed, 
Well, not all these antigens will go systemic. And when that occurs, the animal starts experiencing endotoxemia. Okay, it happens quickly. This is, in, this is data from pigs. Um, this black line here is circulating LPS. And when I say circulating, this is from a jugular stick. So what that means is in, within two hours of being heat stressed, both the local GI tract immune response and the liver has been overwhelmed and LPS is increased by over twofold. And within 12 hours, there's almost a six-fold increase in circulating LPS. So it happens quick. So at this stage of the talk, there's direct and indirect effects of heat stress. There's the strains, hyperinsulinemia, that causes the animal from, from mobilizing adipose tissue. It's not the liver's fault. There's a leaky gut. And at this stage of the talk, we don't know whether there's about almost a pound of glucose is gone. So now I'm going to try to convince you that leaky gut may be partially explaining some poor transitioning dairy cows or ketosis. So the dogma, uh, just a quick reminder, is that excessive adipose tissue mobilization is, is bad and it causes fatty liver and ketosis. And of course, if this is higher, this is a worse problem in high producing dairy cows. So we've had a goal in the industry for a long time, 30, 40 years now, of reducing blood nephes and ketones. So um, and I could have listed a thousand papers probably, and there's probably many of you who are listening on today's um, talk that have done work in this exact field that, that identifies or correlates uh, high NEFAs and high ketones with some type of negative outcome, and it listed them here. I've, I've underlined the word correlated, and I've italicized the word association because it is incredibly difficult to directly study the negative consequences of NEFAs and BHBs on these negative outcomes. In fact, it's almost impossible to cause these negative out outcomes by infusing either NEFAs or BHBs. So one of the things that, oh, about 10, 15 years ago now started to get my attention is, you know, high NEFAs, NEFAs are high in almost all cows after calving. In fact, NEFAs are high in almost all female animals, no matter the species after calving. So, you know, what is it, if all, if NEFAs are high in almost all female animals after calving, what is it about those 10, 15 percent of the cows that get clinically treated for ketosis? Maybe they're more susceptible to ketosis, or maybe there's something predisposing them, predisposing them to not be able to handle these high NEFAs. So there's a variety of, of human bowel disorders, dairy disorders, uh, like celiacs and irritable bowel syndrome, and um, Crohn's disease. These, these diseases, and about one-third of the human population has, has, has one of these type of problems. These diseases have different etiologies, but one of the consequences, or a common consequence, is uh, fatty liver. So what this is just a nice review demonstrating how when these bacteria antigens get through the barrier of the bowel, uh, they stimulate hepatic inflammation, and that this causes or this prevents the liver from um, efficiently exporting VLDL. And as a consequence, the fatty, the liver becomes fatty. And I'm only highlighting this because oftentimes, and I'm just as, um, just as guilty of this, we assume fatty liver is because of high NEFAs and that when an animal has high NEFAs, there's just too many NEFAs coming into the liver and that causes then fatty liver. And, you know, so these people who have these diseases do not have high NEFAs, but they have fatty liver. So an animal can easily get fatty liver without first having high NEFAs. So some, some peculiar observations. I was at the University of Arizona for almost nine years. Uh, Arizona's got high milk production per cow. I assumed when I went there back in 2001 that they would have a high rates of ketosis. They got heat stress and high production, right? Well, they don't. Essentially, ketosis is not a problem in the Southwest. Uh, Clinical rates of ketosis on some farms is less than 0.1%. So why do we have these huge regional differences in ketosis within North America, right? I'm originally from Minnesota, schooled in New York. You know, what is it about the Northeast and Midwest why clinical rates for ketosis are so high? Another thing that uh, I struggled with is that heat stress cows have an increased incidence of fatty liver, and this is despite the fact that they don't mobilize adipose tissue, nearly as much adipose tissue. So if a transitioning cow is heat stressed and doesn't mobilize as much adipose tissue, why on earth would it have an increased likelihood of developing fatty liver? Um, 
I, I've, I've struggled with that one for a long time. The other one is, is something um, that I'm very interested in. There's a guy named Keith Blazier, Professor Blazier from Manitoba, who's been studying luminacidosis with two different types of uh, diets. And I've um, taken the liberty of making some cartoons and, and pulling some data from his papers. What he does then is he initiates rumen um, acidosis or SERA, subacute rumen acidosis, with two different types of dietary strategies. One of them is an alfalfa pellet. The other one is a, is a grain pellet, wheat and some barley and some others. And that causes then a similar um, magnitude or reduced pH in the rumen. But when the animal gets alfalfa-based rumen acidosis, from a blood perspective, right, the, there's no change in, in circulating acute phase proteins or inflammatory markers. The cattle look fine. In the cows that get the grain-induced pellet sera, from a blood perspective, they do look sick. They have a mild fever. They have an increase in circulating LPS and acute phase proteins and, and, and inflammation. So from a blood perspective, right, these cows are this grain-induced rumen acidosis is causing systemic inflammation. Well, so I've kind of put together a little cartoon. The, the, the acidosis stays inside the rumen during alfalfa-induced pellet or alfalfa-induced rumen acidosis, but during grain-induced, because you have an increase in water consumption and a decrease in starch digestion, you end up having too much carbohydrates leave the rumen and some escaping into the large intestine. Now, the, the, the rumen epithelial is between 15 and 18 layers of squamous epithelium thick. The small intestine and in the large intestine is one cell thick. That's how thick the barrier is. So you end up getting large intestine acidosis, and now you got uh, antigens infiltrating into the animal's body and causing an inflammatory response. <coughs> so we're not the only one looking at the transition period of inflammation. Uh, Barry Bradford's group has done a fantastic job of, of characterizing that. Uh, what would be the sources of inflammation? Well, um, clearly metritis and mastitis would be two sources of inflammation, right? Um, and there's also so-called sterile inflammation that could be a source. We believe the GI tract could be uh, a source, and that's what I want to try to get into. So, again, why would a transitioning dairy cow have an increased likelihood of leaky gut? Well, remember back to the Arizona versus Midwest and Northeast example. Um, and, and a big one of the primary differences in diets between the Southwest and the Midwest is, is well specifically with forage is the amount of alfalfa used in the Southwest versus the Midwest. Right in the Southwest, they use a lot more haylage, um, uh, alfalfa haylage in the diet, and I think that could be one of the main reasons why you essentially do not have clinical ketosis in the southwest. Just a little cartoon showing if LPS is able to infiltrate this physical barrier, the first line of the innate immune response is something called LPS binding protein, or LBP for short. LBP will chaperone the LPS to uh, a macrophage, in this particular case, a coop for cell of the liver for detoxification. In that process, there's an inflammatory response in acute phase proteins or synthesized. We did a project where we did, um, uh, we looked at cows going through the transition period on different types of zinc, and the publication is down here. Uh, we had 200 cows, and so some cows obviously went through the transition period and had the problem. So I wanted to identify cows that only had uh, clinical ketosis without some type of other health problem. So if the cows had ketosis and mastitis, they were removed from the data set. If they had metritis, they removed DA, laminitis, anything that would be a logical explanation for inflammation would be removed from the data set. So it turns out we had eight cows that got only treated for ketosis at the Iowa State Dairy, and I found then eight transitioning dairy cows that got treated for no overt health problem. And we looked at LPS binding protein. Remember the thing that binds LPS. And days in milk, relative to calving are on the x-axis and the LBP is on the y-axis. Uh, my friend, Dr. Pat Gordon, treated all the cows for ketosis between days seven and 10 of milk, so right here. And at three days in milk, up to a week prior to um, um, 
treating for clinical ketosis, there was almost a three-fold increase in circling LPS binding protein, or LBP. So that was encouraging enough for us to go um, to explore this further, so we wanted to go to a large dairy. We went to, uh, the dairy had about 3,500 cows, and we sat, we went up there and we, sim we sampled every single cow that went through the transition period for a month. After that month, we brought the students home. I called back to the veterinarian and said, okay, give me a list of cows that get treated for ketosis, but only ketosis. Again, removing the, the obvious sources of, of inflammation, um, metritis, mastitis, DAs, laminitis, et cetera, pneumonia. So we ended up having 22 cows that went through the transition period that only got treated for ketosis on this commercial dairy. They are in red, the, key, the cows that got treated for ketosis between days five and 14 of milk. They left the fresh pen at the 14th day of lactation. So cows that got treated for ketosis out here prior to calving, a week before calving, had an increase in circling LPS, almost threefold. And then that, then that causes an increase in post-calving uh, post LPS binding protein. So again, this data looks just like our one from the uh, Iowa State preliminary data. And I, I have a bunch of serum amyloid A and other haptoglobin data that looks essentially just like this. So again, uh, encouraging that maybe leaky gut is, is uh, con contributing to a problem here, but this is still the same type of association problem that ketones and nephes have with a negative outcome. They're just simply correlated. There's no cause and effect. So to get at that further, <laughs> we wanted to see if we took a mid-lactation dairy cow and deliberately caused it to have leaky gut, what would the metabolic, inflammatory, and production responses look like, right? So uh, we use this thing called a gamma secretase inhibitor. It prevents Crip cells from differentiating into intracytes, and the villi becomes short and blunted and leaky, essentially. And if you're interested in the biochemistry, the, the CRIP cells are down here. GSI disrupts but not signaling. So these CRIP cells then don't differentiate in intracytes, and the animals become and become severe leaky gut. Okay, so we, um, we anticipated that leaky gut would have a negative effect on feed intake, so we use a pair feeding model again. So the GSI in red and the pair feds are in black. And essentially, we, we, we continuously infuse the GSI for 24 hours a day for seven days. And when the animal gets leaky gut, they essentially stop eating. By the seventh day, they're eating less than five kilograms. LPS binding protein, in fact, all the acute phase proteins and inflammatory markers went up, not only in the cows that were given the GSI and had leaky gut, but also in the pair fed controls. And at first, this was disappointing. Uh, until we started to recognize that simply pair feeding or going off feed causes leaky gut, not nearly to the same extent as the GSI, but um, leaky gut nonetheless. And you don't need to have a PhD in gastrointestinal physiology to recognize that um, the GSI was causing some major damage. Here we have a, a normal patty from a well-fed uh, control. The, the pair feds, because they essentially stopped eating, the, the feces becomes dehydrated and pelted, and the GSI at this stage, at the seventh day, there's essentially just defecating mucus. So what happens when an animal has uh, leaky gut is to try to protect itself, the goblet cells make more mucus. And uh, so like I said, on the seventh day, the, this animal is essentially just shitting mucus. Now, looking at insulin and, and the other meta energetic metabolites, Remember, heat-stressed animals have an increase in circulating insulin. And in fact, type 2 pigtotic cows also have an increase in circulating insulin. So the fact that these uh, severely induced leaky gut animals have an increase in insulin um, is interesting, and it fits well with you know, our, our hypothesis. This hyperinsulinemia also then explains the blunt and lethal mobilization and the increase in ketones in both uh, treatments. So and I didn't show you the morphology of the GI tract, but um, so not all, but most of the parameters we looked at, if you cause an animal to have leaky gut, if, if you cause an otherwise healthy animal to have leaky gut, many of the metabolic, inflammatory, and production responses resemble that of, a, of not only a heat stress cow, but also a, a poorly transitioned dairy cow. And in fact, we're using feed restriction now, not using the GSI as a, as a model to induce leaky gut. 
So the next objective then was to identify the magnitude of feed restriction that consistently independently causes intestinal um, permeability and inflammation. So we did an experiment where we had cows on 100% of ad libitum feed intake, that's the AO100, 80% of ad libitum feed intake, 60% of ad libitum feed intake, 40% of ad libitum feed intake. We also measured, uh, looked at this hormone called GLP-2. This paper has been accepted, and I think it will be in the January issue of the JDS. But anyway, and then the 20. And not to get bogged down in the details, but all the markers of inflammation and immune activation were linearly increased with, with uh, advancing feed restriction. So um, I want to just go through some quick data here on, on the negative consequences of feed restriction on, on leaky gut. These are, this is in pigs. But on the left here, we have serum LPS, or circling LPS. This is 12 hours of thuma neutral ad libitum feed intake. This is 12 hours of heat stress. So the only, only insult here is just simply 12 hours of heat stress. And of course, there's almost a five-fold increase in circulating LPS. Now, the experiment also looked at uh, Avela Zinc um, and its ability to improve gut integrity, and it did a great job. Um, here, we're looking at the only insult these controls had was just simply pair fed. So a 50% feed rest, uh, restriction, not feed withdrawal, but just simply 50% feed restriction for 12 hours markedly increases circulating LPS. My point is the negative consequences of just simply having restricted feed intake for 12 hours markedly and, and negatively influences the integrity of the GI tract. So this is 100% feed withdrawal on milk yield. So then we wanted to do a little experiment looking at, well, what are the consequences of being out of feed on, on milk yield? Six hours of feed withdrawal will cause a 22% decrease in milk yield. Now, these cows are being milked every six hours. That's why the y-axis isn't very impressive. But 12 hours of feed, uh, feed withdrawal will decrease milk yield by almost 40%. And that is uh, a lot of money, right? And so the question we have then is how often are cows without feed for, you know, 6 to 12 hours? Obviously accidentally, but I think it happens a lot more than what we want to admit. So why does heat stress and leaky gut increase circling in insulin? Because insulin is the most anabolic hormone we're aware of. Why would it go up during a catabolic condition? Well, when Matt Waldron was studying the uh, consequences of, metabolic consequences of mastitis, he would infuse LPS up the teat canal at time zero. The cow gets a fever, stops eating, gets droopy ears, and two hours later, circling the insulin goes up. It doesn't make sense. Well, we looked at IV um, LPS in, in steers, and both heat stress and thermal neutral steers. We give LPS at time zero, the calf gets a fever, stops eating, lays down, head becomes recumbent. Two hours later, there's a hundredfold increase in circulating insulin. And interestingly, this doesn't cause lethal hypoglycemia. So the ability of the immune system to uncouple insulin's, uh, you know, glucose uptake responsibilities is, is amazing. Same thing happens in pigs. Time zero, give the pig injection of LPS. 16 minutes later, only one hour, there's a fever. And within one hour, there's almost a nine-fold increase in circulating insulin. And again, this is accompanied without a drastic change in circulating glucose. So um, LPS either stimulates or at least augments glucose stimulated in secretion. Remember, LPS is a very um, potent activator of the immune system. And from a, from a um, milk production perspective, insulin is not our friend. Insulin promotes nutrient uh, partitioning away from milk yield. Again, just a quick reminder of how, glucose, how important glucose is. If anything is getting in the way of this pathway, if glucose is being utilized for other purposes other than to make milk, it will markedly decrease milk yield. So um, evolution of this field called immunometabolism. I didn't even know this was a word until a couple of years ago. But I think we need to give credit where credit is due to a guy named Otto Warburg. Otto Warburg recognized that cancer cells and activated immune cells will switch their metabolism to only burn glucose. So during, uh, when an immune cell is not activated, when it's, you know, simply just in circulation and, and then happy and the animal's not experiencing a, an antigen, the immune cell can burn a variety of different fuels. But remember the, the, the energy requirement of an unactivated immune system is 
probably very low. I would I'm guess less than maybe one or two percent of maintenance cost. Um, so anyway, for Otto Warburg's, oh, but once they get activated, once they're activated by an antigen like LPS, they can only burn glucose, and I'll show you that in a second. So anyway, Otto Warburg, Professor Warburg won the 1931 Nobel Prize for those discoveries. Incidentally, he, he had a student in his lab at the time, his name was Hans Kreb, and he was also drinking buddies with Albert Einstein. So Albert, you know, if you wanted to hang out with Otto Warburg, you had to have a, a Nobel Prize. But the Warburg effect, we made a little cartoon to just kind of show it. During, during the rest, the immune cell has a very low ATP requirement. So it can take glucose or fatty acids or amino acids, bring it into the TCA cycle, and have a, you know, and generate ATP. However, once activated by LPS, now they have a very rapid ATP requirement and a huge increase in the, in, in the ATP requirement. And it doesn't have time to wait around for oxygen to get to the extracellular and the mitochondria membrane. So taking glucose down to pyruvate and kicking out that carbon as lactate, it only generates 2 ATP, much less efficient than the 38 ATP of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the TCA cycle, but it's much quicker. So although it's inefficient, this process generates uh, an enormous amount of ATP very, very quickly. And then, not surprisingly, sick animals have an increase in circulating lactate. So, again, just to review, immune cells can oxidize multiple fuels at rest, but once they become activated, they can only burn glucose. And for the last 80 or so years, we don't know how much, right? It's, from, a, from a nutrition perspective, it would be nice to know how much glucose is the immune system using. The problem is measuring uh, nutrient uptake by the immune system is incredibly difficult because it's everywhere it's not like the liver where you can put a, uh, a catheter before and after right that's how we normally study the metabolism of an organ or a tissue the immune system is everywhere every tissue has uh, the immune system and it's dynamic meaning, meaning it changes in circulation very rapidly so quantifying whole body glucose consumption is is, is very very difficult okay so if you look at uh, blood glucose levels in the y-axis following an LPS challenge, it looks like this. If, you, if the animal has not been fasted, there's about three hours of hyperglycemia that occurs following an LPS challenge. This is because the liver's glucose output increases and skeletal muscle and adipose tissue reduce their glucose uptake. And these three things in combination then exceed the immune system's glucose utilization. However, after about three hours and the immune system is fully activated, now um, the liver's ability to increase glucose output, the muscle and the adipose tissues uh, decrease glucose utilization, doesn't equal the amount of glucose utilized by the immune system and the animal becomes hypoglycemic. And in fact, they can become lethally hypoglycemic. So we, had, we just approached this more from a classic metabolism perspective. Okay, could we prevent the hypoglycemia from occurring by starting to inject glucose right here. And then if we could, could we quantify this um, and use this as a proxy of immune system glucose utilization? So this is just a picture of a graduate student injecting LPS into one catheter. On the other catheter is hooked up to a pump. What you can't see is a bottle of dextrose above the pump. And then what we, we measure their blood glucose levels every five minutes. We know what their blood glucose levels should be. And when she starts becoming hypoglycemic, we increase the rate of glucose infusion on the pump. We did this for 12 hours. And we fast the animals. So these are the animals that are fasted. The controls are in black. The animals that were given LPS but were allowed to become uh, um, hypoglycemic are in red. And the animals that were given LPS but prevented um, from becoming hypoglycemic, we call that LPS and euglycemic, are in blue. We subtract out the glucose from the, uh, from the controls, and it's about a kilogram of glucose in 12 hours. So it is an enormous amount of glucose. I recognize that there's limitations in the model, but if the lactating dairy cow acts or resembles um, rodent models, humans, and, and pigs, glucose uptake by other tissues during this in, uh, LPS challenge goes down. And glucose output by the liver actually goes up. So if you include these three different aspects to our estimate, 
What that means is our one kilogram is probably actually underestimated. And I guess at this stage, whether or not it's one kilogram, or even if we're overestimating by 50%, right, 500 grams of glucose is an enormous amount of milk. And extrapolating that to a day, you're looking at almost one or two kilograms uh, of sugar, which would be probably about 95% of a, of a cow's daily maintenance requirements. It's an enormous amount of glucose. To put this perspective in, in the growth, if a, if a finishing steer needed 1,000 grams of glucose, you can follow along the math here if you want, but it would be about 1.3 kilograms of, of lean tissue accretion, which is obviously a lot of money. When we, we've done this in steers, pigs, and twice in cows, when you put this information on a metabolic body weight and compare it across species, it's always right about one grams of glucose per kilogram of metabolic body weight. And I don't think this is a coincidence. Right, the immune system's uh, very, very old, and it's highly conserved amongst species. And so, as a consequence, it gives me a lot of confidence that you know what we're measuring is probably pretty real. So, remember back to the heat stress, and we couldn't find 400 grams of glucose. Well, the reason we can't find 400 grams of glucose is because the cow gets heat stress, it gets leaky gut, leaky gut causes the immune system to be stimulated, and the immune system utilizes extra glucose. So. Can leaky, vet, uh, can leaky gut explain a variety of things that cause suboptimal productivity, not just in dairy cows, but also in almost all animal agriculture? Well, I think it can. I'm very confident that it's the, that the effects are, are of heat stress. But any type of off-feed event, right, uh, transition period, weaning, is, you know, really in the, in, the, in the pig world, as they've demonstrated nicely, that leaky gut you know, occurs after weaning and is responsible for decreased productivity, shipping, overcrowding, untold of feed, drought, anything that prevents the animal from eating when it wants to eat, um, I think will have the potential to cause leaky gut. So what to do about it? Well, obviously we want to prevent infection no matter where it's at. Um, but from a gut health perspective, right, we want to encourage feed intake, make sure there's feed available at all times, maximize digestion prior to large intestine, I don't think the large intestine is structurally sound enough to handle high gut acidosis. Prevent rumen acidosis. Obviously, there's dietary strategies to do that. There's things that we can do to enhance intestinal permeability. There's dietary strategies there. Modulate the immune system um, um, and minimize psychological stress. And I, I didn't get into this, and I'm you know, not a tree hugger, but um, I, I think Psychological stress or emotional stress definitely causes leaky gut, and this has been studied uh, in, in rodents and in humans, and I think this is also a big part of the leaky gut occurs during um, feed restriction. So if you know me, you know how I like cartoons. Um, feed, let's compare the heat stress and unsuccessful transition cow to the successful transition cow. Um, feed is fermented, propionate is converted in the liver to glucose, the pancreas of the transition cow becomes less sensitive to this glucose and it secretes less insulin. That's why the transition cow is hypoinsulinemic. This, coupled with um, insulin resistance at the adipose tissue muscle, allows her to mobilize adipose tissue. Not necessarily five fatty acids go up. Now, um, this NEFIS can be utilized for energy by muscle to make milk fat and be converted in the liver to ketones. Now the successful transition cow can burn acetate for energy, ketones for energy, and NEFIS for energy, and having access to these three different fuels allows her to spare glucose, and glucose can be utilized for the synthesis of milk. This is normal. I, uh, I think we need to stop calling uh, the transition cow metabolically stressed. She's not stressed. There's nothing abnormal about high levels of ketones. It's the way animals have evolved to make milk. Okay, and it's all because of decreased insulin sensitivity. Now let's compare it to the unsuccessful transition cow. The unsuccessful transition cow looks pretty similar, but it does have an increase in circulating LPS. And I think that comes from the hindgut, not from the rumen. But I guess that's maybe more of an academic problem. This causes the liver to become fatty. And once the liver becomes fatty, now she has excessive ketone synthesis. LPS also stimulates the immune system, and the immune system can only burn glucose. So now we have a, a redirection or, or, um, or change in the hierarchy of glucose utilization back over here to the immune system in the mammogram and just simply is no longer the, the priority. Heat stress cow is pretty similar. 
Again, we have propionate to glucose, but LPS is making the pancreas make more insulin than what it should. Incidentally, type 2 ketotic cows also are hyperinsulinemic. This um, LPS stimulates the immune, um, sorry, the immune response. Insulin is then required to have glucose taken up by the immune cells, and this markedly then redirects the hierarchy of nutrient partitioning, and making milk just simply is not uh, uh, a priority. So when to treat ketones, um, for, for ketosis, I mean, think of the, uh, the fresh pen having two cows in it, and there's two, there's, these two cows both have high ketones. Okay, if, if one of the cows have high ketones, but she's not coming into the milk well, she's not aggressively eating, she doesn't look good, she has a mild fever, right? A, a good cow, um, cow man or a, a good milk producer can say, okay, yeah, that, something's not right with that cow. Okay, go ahead and treat her. But the other cow in the fresh pen has high ketones. She's eating like a champion. She's making lots of milk. She looks great. She's no fever, right? And, and, a, and a good cow man would say, She's she's healthy. I like don't don't treat her. She doesn't need to be treated. She's got high te ketones because that's the way Mother Nature has designed her to make a lot of milk. In fact, she's probably the highest milk producing cow in the pen. Anyway, that's I don't know how important that is. But heat stress and ketotic and feed restricted cows um, have a similar metabolic and endocrine footprint. I don't think that's a coincidence. I think it the common denominator is of course leaky gut. Activated immune system utilizes a enormous amount of glucose, and there's things that we can do. And if um, leaky gut, then if this is a fundamental problem that not only is a huge issue in the dairy industry, but maybe transcends species, well, then it's a it's a financial problem that dwarfs maybe all others combined. I I think when a, when a, when someone wants to research um, a target molecule's ability or a capacity to, to help or to ameliorate a problem, it needs to be studied in the stressed model, right? And I, I think that needs to be stressed. Um, so, sorry for the pun. It, a lot of this stuff has been generated by taxpayers, so the USDA, and uh, we've been very grateful. And also there's some key um, collaborators in the, within the industry, Zimpro, Elanco, Kim, and Diamond V, and ADM. These companies and taxpayers allow me to train students these students then go out and hopefully become key uh, industry leaders, and it couldn't be done without the, the help of the industry. And I would be glad to try to dodge questions, answer questions, or whatever it may be. But again, thanks for your attention, and I really appreciate the opportunity to, to present to you. Thank you, Dr. Baumgard. Before we get to our question and answer period, I need to do some housekeeping details. Whilst I introduce our next webinar and thank our sponsors, please start writing your questions in either the chat window or the Q&A tab on your WebEx platform. Next month, on October 11th, our speaker will be Dr. Michael Ballou, who is a nutritional biologist and associate professor with Texas Tech's Department of Animal and Food Sciences and is associate dean of research. Dr. Ballou's research has focused on understanding how the innate immune responses of animals will affect resistance to diseases and how the responses can be changed by management and nutrition. His talk will be Systematic Approach to Improving Immunity in Periparturient Dairy Cows and will take place 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on October 11th. Please join us then. I would like to thank the people who make this possible Tom Taluki and AMTS USA and Global, Marcos Neves Pieria, University of Lavras, Paula Torillo in Argentina, and our translators in each location. We have generous sponsors who make it possible for us to get great speakers and manage the program. We thank our gold sponsor, Ajinomoto Heartland, Superior Nutrition Through Amino Acids, our silver sponsors are Arm & Hammer Animal Nutrition, R&D Life Sciences, Virtus, makers of Strata with EPA, DHA, Omega-3s, and Prequil with Omega-6s, Dairy One Forge Laboratory and Dairyland Laboratories. Our bronze sponsors are Jeffo, Life Made Easier, Adiseo, Amino Max, and Quality Liquid Feeds. I will now open the floor up for questions. 
English language listeners, because we sometimes have trouble with audio for questions, I will read your question. To unmute Dr. Baumgart, who's calling in. Hi, Lance, how are you? Good. How are you doing, Marianne? Uh, <laughs> I'm better. Um, I'm hoping everybody can hear you. I thought right. I would be able to make you a panelist, but I can't, but that's okay. okay. Um, okay. So if you can talk loud, it's a little bit quiet in my ear. I don't know how it is for everyone else. Um, no problem. No problem. I'm gonna... Okay. Um, I have some questions that I'm going to start off with because I think I'm going to give Paula a breather. I think they were having a little bit of technical difficulties on their end. Um, we are joined today by Marcos Piera from Brazil and Paula, Paula Torillo, and they'll be asking questions um, for each of their countries. So my first question is from Jim Aldrich. Um, he asks, what are the major species of LPS producing gram-negative bacteria? Are they ruminal, intestinal, or both? Yeah, hey Jim, uh, great question. Um, all gram-negative bacteria will make LPS, and in fact, gram-positive uh, bacteria also make a toxin. The virulency of each of one of those um, bugs of, of the LPS will be different. Um, and of course, in research, we always use the, the LPS we can buy from Sigma, recognizing the fact, though, that there's probably hundreds, if not thousands, of different types of LPS that the animal is naturally exposed to. And uh, the gram negative bacteria that make those different types of LPS, you know, are completely. 100% to the whole entire GI tract, starting with the animal's mouth all the way to the anus. And um, so, yeah, they're in the rumen. They're uh, probably very small quantities, in, even in the small intestine, but it, then again, of course, in large quantities in, in the large intestine. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. I think I think this recording thing did some nutsy things with all of our connections. I'm waiting on some questions from Paula. Um, let me see if Marcos has any questions. Marcos, I'm going to unmute you. Hi, Marcos. Hi, Marcos. Hi. Hello, Mary. Can, yes, can I can listen? hear you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Baumgart. Thanks for the talk. Very very interesting. The relationship. Uh, between LPS and immunology, and very nice. Uh, I just have a question here. Uh, do, do you have an idea about the requirement of the body for thermal regulation, like for respiration, for change in posture, for vasodilation, for to increase the sweating rate? How much it would increase the energetic cost of a dairy cow? I think in, in, in addition to the requirement for the immune function. Do, do you have any idea about that? In you know, what kind of source of energy source it uses? Is it glucose? Could be NIFA? Do, do you know okay. anything about that? Let me see if I can recapture your question. Um, the, the, the energetic cost to dissipate heat, uh, sweating, mm -hmm. panting, and stuff like that, what's, what's the fuel for that? Mm -hmm. you're asking? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. I assume for um, for most of those fuel selection, that would primarily be acetate. But of course, during uh, heat stress, acetate's contribution to whole animal energetics is going to go down simply because feed intake is going to go down. Um, the next option for fuel would normally be non-certified fatty acids, but of course, heat stress animals aren't even able to mobilize adipose tissue to provide that as a fuel. So then, uh, you know, what's next? Well, amino acids probably aren't a good fuel source because the amount of heat generated from oxidizing amino acids is very high. So, yeah, I, I think um, uh, glucose's contribution to whole animal energetics goes up, uh, not just for the immune system, but probably from a percentage perspective, even in skeletal muscle and, um, and the energy required to, to sweat. Uh, Lance, I, I, I'm just wondering, for example, you, you said something very interesting that your cows on heat stress don't have fat liver. <laughs> and on your experiments, when you restrict feed those cows, they lose weight, okay? Yes. And at similar gut field, because the dry matter intake is basically the same. Could those cows be using EFAS for thermoregulation? 
could be this part of the no increase in plasma NIFA concentration? See, do, do you have any evidence to say that? See, because you just you use NIFA to say that they're not mobilizing fat, right? But yeah. it could be using NIFA as well. Oh, I understand. But, uh, yeah, yeah okay. so the question is, well, maybe they're utilizing NIFA so quickly that the blood yeah. content uh, stays low. Yeah, that that's a um, that's a potential explanation. Um, we use some other evidence to suggest that it's, it's that's not it. One of them is is ketone synthesis, and, and and that's down as well. And the other one is the lipolytic response to an epinephrine challenge. So you know, like you like you right, correctly mentioned, when we're looking at basal levels of daily NIFAs, that in in theory could be due to just simply increased removal from circulation. But um, we're also looking at the lipolytic response and epinephrine challenge, which is very much more blunted during heat stress. So, you know, coupling these other lines of evidence together, you know, the, from a weighted evidence perspective, we, we think that the, uh, we're pretty confident. And also, I'll give you another piece of evidence. Right? When, when, heat, when heat stress growing animals go to market, they're fatter than what they would be predicted based upon feed intake. So uh, again, essentially all, all evidence suggests that adipose tissue mobilization in this transcend species is, is blunted during a, during a heat load. So they just oh, don't okay, have thank you. Yeah, no problem. Good, very good question. Okay, thanks a lot. Marcus, thank you. Hi, Paula. Thank you for the presentation. It was great. Thank you. I have one question from Uruguay. It's from Eduardo. In a situation of heat stressed cows, how much time should we expect low lactose levels? Mm. Yeah, good question. So essentially, you're asking how quickly can they recover from the heat stress event? And um, yeah, well, you know, luckily the the GI tract. Is the half life of the cells lying in the GI tract is about three to four days. And so the GI tract becomes quite, um, if you looked at the morphology of the GI tract after a heat wave, within, within five to seven days, there, no damage is even visible. But that doesn't mean that there's lingering effects of the immune response. The immune response stays activated for a few days. So, um, you know, with, with regards to return of milk yield, it's also a little bit maybe uh, stage of lactation dependent, but an early lactation or new lactation cow is going to bounce back probably within five to seven days. Uh, late lactation cow might not bounce back at all. It seems as if when they're hit hard, milk yield goes down, and, and they don't recover nearly as, to the same extent as a mid-lactation cow does. Great. Okay. okay, Paula, go ahead and ask your next question. Okay. I have a question from Pedro. Of all the blood indicators you mentioned, how would you rank them? Um, I'm sorry, how would, I, how would I do what? How would you rank the indicators, the blood indicators you mentioned, like LPS, binding proteins? Oh, you mean, you mean laboratory analysis, you mean? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, those are just assay plates that we can buy on. We can buy. Um, uh, speaking of that, though, LPS is a really difficult molecule to measure, primarily because there's LPS everywhere. Like when you buy equipment, you know, pipette tips, transfer pipette tips, plates. When I say plates, I mean 96 volt plates. They all are already contaminated with LPS. So if you're wanting to measure LPS, you got to go to great lengths to buy pyrogen-free everything. Um, otherwise, the assay becomes contaminated, and that's why when you look at the literature, the LPS concentrations are wildly different amongst uh, uh, publications. So because LPS is so darn variable and difficult to measure, we we utilize uh, essentially a, a profile of uh, of uh, acute phase proteins, including LPS binding protein, as as a proxy or a measurement of LPS. It's not ideal, but measuring LPS is just very very difficult. So, good question. 
Oh, okay. And I have another one uh, from Eduardo. Uh, could you tell us how heat stress influences somatic cell count? Yeah, another great question. So, you know, oftentimes uh, the incidence of mastitis uh, will go up during the summertime, and same thing with milk somatic cell count. Now, it's difficult to differentiate between what is actually the direct effect of heat versus the environmental aspects of heat stress, right? Cows will drink uh, more, than, more than double their intake of water, so they're urinating more. And, of course, dairymen are probably trying to cool cows using evaporative cooling, like misters or sulkers or something like that. So during heat stress, the environment gets more wet and, and more damp. You know, the, the dairy get, becomes sloppy. And so it's difficult to determine whether or not the increase in milk somatic cell count is going up because of, their, of the direct effects of heat versus just simply the dairy getting damp and wet and sloppy. I will say in Arizona, where it's a very dry heat, uh, we typically do not see a, a significant increase in milk somatic cell count during the summertime. But of course, that's a very dry, uh, you know, low humidity type of heat. That's why I think most of our increase in milk somatic cell count is a uh, is an environmental issue, just simply due due uh, to there too much water or too much urine um, in the environment. Very good question. Okay, great. Okay, Paula, I have a, a question in my window, but I'm going to have uh, Marcos ask a question first. Okay. Okay. Marcos, go uh, ahead. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, hi, Lance. You made uh, a very interesting comment about mucus in feces as a sign of leaky gut. Th does it happen in other species out, like in swine? Or okay? and can I say like if I have mucus in feces, I have a leaky gut? Well, yeah. I think if you can visibly see mucus in, in the feces like a mucin cast or, or a mucus like that came from that GSI experiment, I think that's a very strong indicator that, you are, that the hind gut has been damaged. And the, and the way that the animal is trying to protect itself is by making more mucus, right? The, the hind gut epithelial is only one layer thick, and uh, so one of the key ways to prevent infiltration of unwanted molecules is by that having that thick layer of mucus that's lined the... Um, that lines the epithelium. So, yeah, I, I, I think if you're seeing mucus in feces, uh, you can be pretty confident that there's some damage in the hind gut. And, and, I, and I think that transcends feces. Okay, thank you. I have, I have yeah. a just one. Uh, how, how, how would you balance the role of the roaming versus the lower tract on the, as a source of LPS in, in, in dairy cows? Like if you can have leaf, uh, like intestinal damage, but you can have rumen wall damage also. Correct. As you said, yeah, LPS yeah. could come from the rumen also. Yep, it, and it could. Uh, remember the, the the structure of the ruminal wall is at least four different uh, stratas of squamous epithelia thick, and by some accounts, you, you could end up having 18 layers of of of, of uh, of squamous epithelium, of course, the top layer being dead keratinized cells. But um, so I think, you know, the rumen it was designed structurally to handle low pH, or at least small periods, short periods of low pH, where, of course, the hind gut, starting at the small intestine, right, that, that whole epithelium is only one layer thick. So um, differentiating where that LPS is coming from, whether or not it's the rumen or the hind gut, uh, is is very difficult, if as of, from what I can tell, probably impossible, and maybe it's more of an academic issue, you know. Um, but because once that LPS is is infiltrated, either the rumen barrier or the large intestine barrier, it's going to stimulate an immune response. So, from a practical standpoint, it, I guess it might not even matter. Um, but yeah, it it as far as I'm aware of impossible at the moment to distinguish where that LPS is coming from. Good. Very, very good. Okay, thank you. Thank yep. you. Ah, um, this is um, 
a question from Eduardo. In Uruguay, during February, we had a lot of heat stress. And during a couple of months after February, we had low lactose levels. Could you make some comments about that? Yeah, good, uh, yeah, good question. And I don't, um, you know, I don't for sure know the answer, but um, if the, you know, if the long-term consequences of that severe heat stress was immune activation, now, I wouldn't think it would normally be for months, but, uh, you know, if there's some chronic immune activation going on, that's going to redirect that pathway of glucose leaving the liver and, and being utilized by the mammary gland. It's going to redirect, you know, redirect the hierarchy of, of glucose use. So, you know, the, the low lactose levels, you know, could be, could be due to just simply um, the immune system utilizing more glucose than what it normally does. Great. And I have another question. Um, is the, the use of protective glucose uh, recommended in, this, in these cases of his stress? Well, that's a great question. Um, and, you know, as far as I'm aware of, we don't have access to a product right now that provides uh, bypass glucose. But, yes, I think in situations where uh, glucose availability is limiting, um, that, that might be a strategy that's, that, that could be pretty effective. Um, you notice from that one experiment, though, when we infused glucose after an LPS challenge, that did not rescue or prevent the decrease in milk. So that's probably because mammary epithelial cells have uh, receptors for LPS or TLR4 receptors. But during normal situations that aren't, like maybe the transition period, um, you know, I could see maybe where a bypass glucose product could be effective. As long as that bypass product of glucose doesn't uh, do a couple things. One, you know, that we don't want that glucose ended up in the large intestine. I think that'd be dangerous. And two, um, what happens to liver natural hepatic glucose output, right? If, if glucose being absorbed by the small intestine just simply reduces the need of the liver to make glucose, well, then it's probably going to be a wash. But, yeah, I would be very interested in seeing the effectiveness of a bypass glucose product in heat stress cows and transition cows. I think that would be very interesting. <laughs> Lance, the question that I have for you is um, from um, Euler uh, Rabello, and he asks, can you expect lower incidence of subclinical sub ketosis in the summer due to heat stress? Yeah, that's a great question, I, and I would have thought that to be the case. But the Italian group, led by Umbrito Bernabucci, has done a really nice job of describing that uh, heat-stressed cows during the summertime have an increased incidence of fatty liver and, and ketosis. And for a long time, that I really struggled with that. How, you know, how could that happen if they're having a blunted uh, lipolytic response? Well, it turns out that... Uh, LPS and other antigens derived from the gut cause hepatic inflammation, and that hepatic inflammation then causes the, the reduction in uh, liver fat export. So that's why um, um, animals that, and, and humans, by the way, that have a bowel um, a barrier dysfunction like Crohn's or celiacs or irritable bowel, et cetera, these people will typically have fatty liver but they almost never have high levels of NEFA. And I guess my point of, of emphasizing here is that an animal can get fatty liver and result in ketosis without first having high NEFAs. And I think that's exactly what happens during uh, to a heat stress transitioning cow. Okay. Um, how much time does it take to become healthy again after a leaky gut event? Yeah. Great question, and uh, I think it's luckily for the gut, the, the half-life of, of a GI tract is about three to five days. So within three to five, six days, you know, the morphological, there's really no morphological evidence of, of a previous insult. But that doesn't mean that there's a still lingering activated immune response, and I think that probably lasts about seven to ten days. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, luckily the gut heals itself pretty quickly. Great. 
And another question from Carlos. Can we determine blood white cells to assess the degree of heat stress? No, very good question. And I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, essentially asking if you could use uh, changes in CBC count to, to help diagnose or detect heat stress. And um, that's a great question. I just don't know the answer. Okay. Paula, do you have another? Okay. <laughs> um, this is again from Euler Rabello. Um, VD, v, uh, excuse me, VLDL export from the liver in ruminants is, um, is low. Can it be reduced by the effects of LPS? Yes, I, well, I, and that's a great question. And it's another one that I do not know, but I suspect it, it could be because the mechanism by which LPS reduces VLDL export in monogastrics isn't isn't clearly understood, at least from what I understand. So, um, you know, it probably has something to do with some type of APO protein that's needed for VLDL export. And I suspect the ruminant liver, which is already, like, like, the, like the question states, um, a suboptimal at, at uh, exporting lipid, will also be sensitive to LPS-induced um, reduced VLDL export? That was a very good question. Okay. Um, let's see. Marcos has a question. I'm going to let him ask while Paula is translating. Okay, Marcos? Okay, Mary. Uh, Lance, uh, sh sh should we be measuring LPS as a marker of acidosis more frequently? Do you think so? Like we, like measuring D lactate, for example, do, do you think it's a good marker? Well, again, um, yeah, I mean, it depends on. First of all, LPS is very difficult to measure. It's it's just so problematic. Uh, and then two, of course, um, the LPS is detoxified quite quite quickly, um, and the animal builds up large quantities of tolerance to LPS. So. Um, you know, measuring it, I guess also depends where would you measure it. I don't think it's of value to measure it in the lumen of the of the GI tract because I think there could be, you know, many grams of LPS there, but if the barrier function is healthy, it doesn't matter. It's only when the barrier function becomes compromised that that any quantities, even incredibly small quantities of LPS infiltration is going to cause a problem. Um, so, you know, these other acute phase proteins that are re very responsive to LPS infiltration, like haptoglobin, serum labor A, these are more routine uh, analyzed um, acute phase proteins. They're not specific to LPS, but, you know, I think it, when put in the context, they can be used as a marker of, of um, either acidosis or some type of gut barrier dysfunction. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marcos. Paula, are you ready with your question? Yes. Uh, I'm, I really don't understand the, the question, but I, I will try to read it. Is it possible that the increased glucose use by the immune system is driving an increase in somatic cells? No, I don't understand that one either. <laughs> um, I think maybe the question is uh, because there's an increase in, 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 in presumably in, in circulating white blood cells, that this then increase in circulating LPA or white blood cells would find their way into the mammary gland. And uh, I, I don't think so. Um, but what is interesting to the person's question is um, IV LPS, so if infusing LPS into the jugular vein will compromise the tight junction um, integrity of the mammary gland. So we'll see an increase in, in, in uh, milk somatic cell count during an IV LPS infusion. So my, I guess my point is LPS derived from either the, from, um, the uterus or the gut or the lung have, has the opportunity to compromise the um, mammary tight junction proteins. 
So, yeah, I think the question may be on to something. <laughs> Uh, Lance, when you talked about treating cows, uh, fresh chaotic cows, with uh, uh, low milk yield, low dry matter intake, and high NIFA, uh, which would be the recommended treatment for you? Well, probably nothing. So, okay, let me back up and explain that more. So, you know, the cow that's not eating well, doesn't look good, has a mild fever, um, the high NEFAs and ketones in that particular cow um, are a reflection of, of, a, of the original problem. And that original problem is probably some type of subacute infection, either by the gut or metritis or mammary gland, right? And so they're not eating. And as a consequence, the high NEFAs and high ketones are just simply a consequence of some other problem. You could treat that cow with propylene glycol and arbitrarily or you know, exogenously reduce the circulating NEFAs and ketones, and, and you, you know, that might make you feel better. But still, the, the problem, the reason why she has high blood NEFAs and ketones hasn't been solved. So, um, and I know this, you know, I know that flies in the face of 45 years of dogma, but um, yeah. I, I, I just think. Right, high high ketones and nephas in a healthy cow, it, that's just the way the metabolism works. That's the way she makes a lot of milk. And in fact, oftentimes the highest producing cows in that fresh bin are the ones that have the highest ketones, and that's not surprising. Okay, great. Um, would you yes? Would you use Would you use some? Drugs uh, like anti-inflammatory drugs. I don't know if it's correct. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, like maybe meloxicam or something like that. Yep, yep, yep. So um, we looked at uh, banamine's or an NSAID uh, administration uh, a few years ago in transition cows and did not have great luck uh, with that. Uh, Barry Bradford's been looking at uh, some some essentially aspirin uh, effects and seeing you know, seeing um, some beneficial effects sometimes. So you know, the question is, you know, if you prevented inflammation, would cows take off like a rock star? And um, I think it depends. Uh, you know, like I said, we didn't have good luck by inhibiting the COX-2 pathway. Um, but you know, I mean, there's other ways to prevent inflammation where you can get a beneficial effect. Um, Barry has seen some nice long-term consequences long-term improvements in milk yield with aspirin treatment in early lactation. Um, so, yeah, I think this is an area that, you know, requires more research to have a definitive answer. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay. No problem. Um, I am out of questions and Paula is out and Marcos is out. So I think we can let you continue on your drive at this point. <laughs> And I probably went for the headaches. I've been at the AABP meetings all day, and I just got done. So uh, I appreciate your guys' flexibility and understanding. Well, thank you. And um, we had so many comments that it was a great presentation. Buzz Burhens was in earlier, and he had to leave when um, things went weird with the the audio. So he said it was a really good presentation. He appreciated listening to you. Uh, yeah, I think highly of Buzz, so a compliment from him is, means a lot to me. Oh, good, good. All right, well, thank you so much, Lance. Um, I just want to let everybody know that still listening is that um, next month is also going to be on immunology. So if you couldn't get enough this time, go ahead and join next month. So, all right. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Marcos. And thank you. Um, Lance, we'll thank talk you. To you soon. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks Goodbye. Bye bye.